toward the end of the video that you saw, this, the clip, uh, she talks about forgiveness. So I want to describe a little bit of, of an experience that I had. Christopher Hitchens, the arch atheist, one, one of the new arch atheists, had written a book that had come out right before I got there. I didn't know about it before I got there, but the sisters had told me about it. And I went and bought it and read it while I was there. It's a very critical book about Mother Teresa, and he called it the missionary position. It followed a BBC show where, that he did um, in Great Britain that's, that was called The Angel of Darkness, I think, or The Angel of Death. So this book is out, and the sisters tell me about it, and I read it. One of his big complaints about the missionaries of charity is that they, they took money from people that he calls politically incorrect or politically corrupt, one or the other. And he uses the example of Charles Keating, actually a person in the area I live in, Los Angeles, who had sort of organized a big savings and loan scandal, which probably looks like stealing uh, bubble gum from the store compared to what we're going through now. But nevertheless, Keating was kind of in the news. And he had sent her a million dollars. And Mother Teresa had cashed the check. But Mother Teresa believed in divine providence. Divine providence is the idea that if you're doing what God has called you to do, it's his responsibility to pay for it. <laughs> to provide you whatever you need, whether it's, you know, a bread truck that just, you're out of food in the bread truck that's headed for a school, the, school, the plumbing breaks and the bread truck ends up donating the bread to you. So um, Mother Teresa and the Missionaries of Charity, believe it or not, don't read the Los Angeles Times, the London Times, or the Wall Street Journal, so they really don't know who sends them money. Even if they did, it wouldn't matter because their constitution, because of their strong belief in divine providence, their constitution forbids them from ever asking for money. Mother Teresa and the missionaries of charity, I, I knew a person who once was working with them and she left because they wouldn't do it. But they will, they'll ne they never ask for money. If you donate, like I said, she, if you want to give her something, she says, you know, give until it hurts. But <laughs> So I had read the book. And I'm sitting on a bench outside the main office. I, ha I was working with uh, sick and handicapped children several blocks from the, what was called the mother house where we would all start in the morning. We would go there and, and have mass and then a little breakfast of a tiny cup of tea and a little square of bread and one of those tropical tiny bananas. And, um, and I'm, but I had been sent back to pick up some materials for the sisters at the center where I was. And Mother Teresa sits down on the bench with myself and, and a, um, a, a priest from India who was there. And she starts telling us all gleefully that some Hindu students had raised some money and they had, were donating money to different ministries that worked with the poor. And they had just brought her some money. And that she was going to put it in something called Mother's Little Bank. And the sisters used to tease her about this. This was the bank where you just got a little pot of money and then, you know, sometimes they would actually send one of their, the children that had never been adopted but who had grown up there, they might use that bank to send them to college even. But this time they were going to use them, some of the money for her new ministry, which was a ministry to prostitutes. They would pay for prostitutes to get out of jail. They would put them with the, to live in the same center as, as the sisters, and the sisters would te teach them, um, well, other work. <laughs> well, I couldn't resist because I had just read the book, and I knew she knew about the book because she's quoted... Well, because the sisters had told me about the book and because she's quoted in the book um, about the film. So I knew she knew about it. So I said, well, Mother, there are people who write books about you that say you don't need any more money and that you have a lot of money that you haven't even spent yet. And she, she looked at me kind of quizzically and then she said, oh, the book, it matters not, he's forgiven. Well, I couldn't let that go either. Because he knew she had said that. <laughs> so in the book, I said, well, Mother, he's kind of a rate in the book that you, that you said that you, forgived him, that you forgave him because he said he didn't need to be forgiven and he didn't ask you to forgive him. And she looked at me like I didn't understand, and she said, it's not I that forgives, it's God. God has forgiven him. Ask the sisters. So I went back to the place where I worked and I asked some of the permanent sisters and sure enough they had all taken this one copy of the book that a volunteer had given them. They had agreed, uh, the permanent sisters, to pass it around for a couple of weeks 
till everybody had, all the permanent sisters had a chance to read it. Then they announced a week when the permanent sisters would fast and pray that God would reveal to them why this book was out. What was God's message to them from the book? And they did, and I asked them what they found out, and one of the sisters said to me, just, she just looked at me and so sweetly said, oh, it's a call for us to become more holy. Now, I've never felt that way about Christopher Hitchens, quite frankly, but, <laughs> but they had not only completely forgiven Christopher Hitchens, but they had taken to praying for him. Because in the missionary's constitution, listed among the poorest of the poor, those who can't get services, are radical atheists. So he was actually on their list for service. So they, they began praying for him. We all know, I think each of you in the, in the audience tonight can imagine right now somebody that you know whose life, and maybe it's yourself or a family member, and maybe it's a friend, Somebody whose life has been diminished because they're just not able to forgive something that happened in their life. Something happened and they just um, can't let it go. According to Judeo-Christian principles, the universe is created with a set of physical laws, obviously, like gravity. But the universe is also created with a set of laws that govern human flourishing. That is, how, how we live the best. How can we live our lives the most optimally? And it ha the Bible actually has laws in it that are both so would, come, would be classified as sociology, economics, uh, politics, morality, law. It doesn't matter. Psychology. And one of those that's in psychology, one of the major laws is forgiveness. Radical forgiveness. This is not just, I'm sorry, okay, I'm sorry, those kind of things. This is radical forgiveness, meaning that you forgive other people when, number one, they don't even know they need to be forgiven, and number two, they haven't asked you. Okay, this, this kind of forgiveness is actually modeled by Christ on the cross, where he's being hung on the cross, and at the same time, he's actually forgiving people who don't know they need to be forgiven. In fact, they think they're doing God's work, and they, and they certainly have never asked him to forgive them. So, in, in Christianity, this is, a, this is a principle for human flourishing. If it is true, then breaking that law will result in exactly the same problem as breaking the law of gravity. It'll be slower than jumping off the top of a building, but your life, our life, my life will be immediately begin to diminish. I had a pastor who once said that unforgiveness was like drinking poison and hoping the other person died. <laughs> For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.